if we're already live. Um, well, we've been there, so we're pr you're probably not going to stand, but please join us as we worship.
praise you this morning in all your glory. We thank you for all that you've done and all that you are doing and all that you will do. And we just pray that you draw us closer to you in this moment and every day and always. Help us now to put all our trust in you, not to lean on our own understanding or our own abilities, but to trust in you we acknowledge you as the one true God and ask that you guide our path. We pray specifically now for David Weeb with YWAM now in California. We ask that you bless and protect him. And as he seeks your will, that you will speak to him and guide his path. We pray for the pastoral search committee that we will continue to acknowledge that you already know the plans, that you are already preparing the next pastor. And I pray that you guide our committee to, uh, to follow your path, for it to be your will. And many of us are here with burdens or sorrows or distractions, worries, sicknesses, those that are our own and those of ones that we care about. God, I ask that you hear all our prayers right now that you will bring comfort and peace and restoration and healing and the power we know that you have and we've seen before. Refresh your spirit in each of us and speak to our hearts and our minds as we worship. Speak to our hearts and minds as we hear your scripture and speak to our hearts and minds through Leighton's message. We ask these things in the power of Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated a minute. I'm going to read the passage that Leighton's message is on, and it's just a few verses. It's from Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 17. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples, a large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. And looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their fathers treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. 
Woe to you when all men speak well of you. That is how the fathers treated the false prophets. But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who, do, who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. I'm going to continue on in worship now. So you're welcome to stand with us as we continue. the world but it couldn't fill me a man's empty praise treasures of faith
Reg is going to come and give announcements and introduce Pastor Layton. Good morning, and welcome to Oak Bluff Bible Church. I hope you've been enjoying the morning so far. It, uh, it's always great to get together as a, as a church family, isn't it? And so whether you're here in the building or whether you're watching online, uh, we just want to give you a special welcome. And um, just like I have some fancy new glasses here to see my notes, uh, our prayer is that through the songs we've been singing, through the scripture we're reading, and through the sermon we're about to... Uh, here, I pray that we'll see God a little more clearly as well this morning. And so, just encourage you to, to focus in on God and His goodness. And, uh, and so, it's great to be here. So we just have a couple of announcements. Um, we started last week uh, our prayer time again. Uh, it is online on Zoom. So, if you look at um, the email on Tuesday night, there is a link in there. So, uh, you're encouraged to join us. There's lots to pray about, and uh, so it's always great to have a good number joining in. So that's Wednesday nights at 7.30, and the link is in our church email. Uh, like Darla already prayed for the pastoral search committee, they've started meeting, and uh, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of excitement about that. And uh, they've already got some names. They haven't even put out the application or the, I guess, the ad, and there's already a couple of names they have to, to look at, so... Be in prayer for them, for wisdom and for unity and just God's leading, uh, that they would be uh, sensitive to that and that God would bring just the right uh, candidates here and right couple. You can also pray for, I guess, the upcoming, as the government is sort of re-looking at uh, an opening plan for the province. Uh, they were supposed to make an announcement here on the 1st. They already did, and they've extended the current regulations till the February the 8th. So that's another week. So be in prayer about that, as that will directly impact on us and our worshiping together as we move forward. So um, we can be praying for them so that they have wisdom. As well, on February 13th, Franklin, who is Kathy's friend, is coming from Uganda and will be speaking at the church. And so we'd encourage you all to, whether you can make it here or watch online, be a part of that. And if the regulations allow, we'd like to have a bit of a potluck lunch so that people can visit with him and, and each other. We haven't been able to do that for a long time, so uh, it would be great if we could do that. So let's be in prayer about that. And I think that's it for the announcements that I have. Uh, this morning, we were supposed to have Leighton Friesen here, who's our conference pastor. And by that introduction, you should probably pick up that he's not here this morning. He ran into some uh, COVID issues back home. I don't think he's sick, but he had some contact, and so... He's playing it safe, and rather than bring anything here, he's courteous enough to stay at home. But he did record his sermon, so we're going to do something a little differently this morning. We're going to have a, a video sermon, which he prepared this week. So we're still getting Leighton, just not in person. So, uh, so uh, it, he's going to be speaking on scaling the mountain of the life Jesus leads, and it's going to be a continuation in the series that John's been talking on um, for the Come and See series out of Luke. So... Sit back, relax, and uh, enjoy uh, the sermon. What else do you say? It's almost like we're at a movie here. So, blessings to you all. Hello, everyone. It's good to be with you in this way. And I am uh, honored and privileged to be able to share the good news with you today. This morning, I want to take your thoughts to Luke chapter 6, beginning with verse 17. And I'd encourage you to find that passage in your Bibles and uh, read it along with me. As you know, the churches of the EMC are walking through the stories of Jesus seeking spiritual renewal. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could really think like Jesus, if we genuinely had Jesus's perspective, if we had his attitude about things, if we had his power, the power of his personality, the power of his, his actions, his commitment. But often it seems to us that Jesus is somebody that we will never ever be like. 
And I think a lot of us walk around with that discouraging thought nagging in our minds. And maybe that's never more true than in this Sermon on the Plain that we are looking at here in Luke chapter 7. In this sermon, Jesus says things that we, we, we struggle with. He, say, he says things that we find very hard to understand. In this Sermon on the Plain, we get a glimpse of how Jesus actually expected his disciples to live in ways that seem almost unreal and impossible to us. When we read through this, I think we should all feel like we're standing beside a vast mountain. There's the soaring peak of Christ's spirituality, of his morality, of his obedience, of his ethics. And we are standing on the plain, looking up at this soaring mountain. And the mountain kind of reaches beyond our sight and is veiled by the clouds. This is daunting. And it can almost make you dizzy looking up at this high mountain and imagining that you could live like this. Well, let's go through this, let's go through this sermon on the plain. Uh, Jesus begins with four blessings in verse 20. He says, Blessed are you who are poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what they did, that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. Now, when Jesus says, blessed are the poor, blessed are the hungry, and so forth, I think what he's saying is, you're the lucky ones. You folks that are hungry, this is your happy day. Those of you who are weeping, you just won the lottery. Are you one of those people that other people hate? and exclude and defame, Jesus said, you should be so happy about that situation that you are dancing in the streets and leaping for joy. And let's be clear, Jesus in this passage here in Luke 6 is not just talking about those who are kind of spiritually poor or spiritually hungry. No, I think he really means the people that you and I, everyone else would think of as poor. We might say the people who are poor in every way, they live in terrible poverty and their poverty means to them that they have very few friends, they have very few resources that other people would consider worthwhile. And what's even worse is they believe deep down that their poverty is a curse from God on their lives, maybe a punishment for their sins. And so they feel like they are spiritually impoverished as well. They're living full on poverty. That's economic, it's social, it's spiritual. They have everything that poverty can throw on them. And Jesus says, if that's who you are, you are the lucky ones. You are the ones who today have won the lottery. And this is what Jesus seems to be announcing as a fact. He is saying, this is actually the way it is. And then just to make it even clearer, Jesus then calls out four curses or woes. He says, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. Ouch. And these, these four woes are the exact mirror of the blessings that Jesus uh, spoke before. Jesus says, if you've got it good now, if everyone is looking at you and saying, wow, that guy's got it made. He doesn't seem to have any worries. He's got a great salary. He's got his family around him. He's got this great pension that's going to look after him when he turns 55. He's Mr. Popularity. He's got thousands of people following him on Twitter. They're quoting him in the Harvard Business Review and so on. Jesus would say, too bad for him. Things are going to go badly for him. There is a disaster just around the corner, and it's going to be spectacular. So what is going on here anyways? What kind of a perspective on the world 
does Jesus have here? What does Jesus seem to know about the world that we don't know? Why can he make these kind of sweeping pronouncements about who's the lucky ones and who's the doomed ones? And furthermore, what would it look like for us to live with this attitude of Jesus? What if we really took Jesus' word for it and really treated people according to these announcements? What if we treated ourselves according to these announcements that he makes here? I mean, it just seems to me as I read this that Jesus has a view of the world that is so different than ours. You know, we, we maybe get a little glimpse of it sometimes. We sometimes tell stories about how happy the people in Haiti seemed to be when we did our mission trip down there. Oh, they had, they had nothing, but they seemed happy and hospitable. But I wonder, is that really what Jesus is talking about here? Or, or maybe we say, well, Jesus is saying, if, if we become poor, spiritually speaking, if we admit that we need Jesus to forgive our sins, then Jesus is going to come into our lives and bless us with eternal life. But I wonder, is that really what Jesus is getting at here, though? Is that simply what he's saying? You know, I think we just need to sort of take Jesus at his very simple word here, even if we can't quite imagine how it could be so. It seems that Jesus has some secret about the world. He knows some deep truth about the world that we can't see that somehow allows him to say that if you are poor, if you are hungry, if you are weeping, if people hate you, then things are about to get good and you will be among the fortunate ones. Jesus seems to feel or Jesus seems to have some kind of information that we don't have. But then Jesus goes on to, says, uh, to say a few things that are even more strange. He says in verse 27, But I say to you, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Now, isn't that just remarkable? I think those of us who have been listening to this passage all our lives, we really need to step back here and just be amazed at, at what Jesus is actually claiming here, what he's actually teaching here. Who even lives like that? Who would even want to? What kind of a world would we have to live in to make this seem feasible and this seem responsible? And then Jesus says, if you love those who love you, oh, well, what credit is that to you? Whoopee. Even sinners love those who love them, uh, who, who love them. That's not even amazing at all. It's not even difficult. Jesus might say, even, even your dog likes those who like her. Anyone just needs to follow their natural instincts and they can love their friends. But Jesus is saying, what I am doing, the life that I am showing you, the way that I want you to live goes way far beyond anything that anybody could do by natural instincts. Maybe if, if we were saying this today, we might say that the world can accomplish a small amount of goodness maybe through anger management classes or parenting models or counseling or medication or education, the world can accomplish a certain amount of goodness. But the life that Jesus calls us to lead goes vastly far beyond all that. There is no therapy that is sufficient to get you to live the life that Jesus calls you to live. Now, that doesn't mean that therapy is a bad thing. Jesus doesn't say that the natural way of living is bad. He's just saying it's not enough. It will not get you to the exalted, soaring way of living that Jesus is announcing here. In fact, Jesus says the only model for this life that Jesus calls us to live, the only model is God, who is kind to the ungrateful and to the wicked. And then he says, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So there you have it. In these short verses, 
we get a glimpse of someone that we, we, we begin to suspect we're dealing with someone here who sees the world completely differently than we do, differently than what we would ever expect. Jesus sees the world in a, in a unique way. He calls us to do things that nobody else is calling us to do. It's like Jesus is on another plane somewhere, and yet he says, follow me. Jesus actually expected his disciples to live like this. He never apologizes to them for demanding these visions of them. And I think that when we hear these lofty demands that Jesus makes, we're sometimes intimidated, aren't we? We feel this sense of heaviness about this. We feel, you know, maybe we feel guilty. Uh, maybe maybe we wish that Jesus just hadn't placed such a heavy burden. Jesus, couldn't you just make it easier? Couldn't you uh, couldn't you just imagine something a little bit more manageable, a little bit more doable? Well, I want to suggest a different way to look at this today that might be helpful in how we understand this. Imagine a twelve-year-old peewee hockey player. Maybe you don't have to imagine. Maybe you are one. This twelve-year-old hockey player is sitting on the couch watching Connor McDavid, the greatest hockey player in the NHL. And this 12-year-old is absolutely mesmerized and excited by the incredible way that Connor McDavid can skate. Now, my question is, is that 12-year-old sitting there on the couch with a sense of shame and embarrassment that he can't skate like Connor McDavid? I don't think so. That 12-year-old is inspired. He's, he's thinking to himself, I'm going to go to the driveway right now and get practicing. Someday I want to be like that. I think that's how we should understand this Sermon on the Plain. Here's how that might work. Let me just explain that for you. Part of understanding this passage, I think, is to read verses 17 and 18 of chapter 6, just before... Jesus starts teaching. Crowds are coming from all over. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were, uh, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. I think that's a, a hugely important picture to have in your mind as you try to imagine the life that Jesus is describing here. Power came out from Jesus and he healed them. I think that's why the poor are so lucky. Because Jesus is healing their diseases. That's why the hungry are filled now. Because Jesus is filling them. That's why the more, those who mourn are laughing. Because Jesus is raising the dead. The people who had died are being raised. That's why those who are being reviled and hated should leap for joy. Because they're sharing in the lot of Jesus himself. And just like Jesus is going to be killed, but then rise from the dead, so those who are hated on his account are going to likewise be raised from the dead. The world is upside down now, Jesus is saying, because Jesus is turning it upside down. Jesus is miraculously healing people, and that's why sick people are the lucky ones. Jesus is casting out demons. That's why the oppressed are the fortunate ones. Jesus is vindicating the way of God by his own death and resurrection, and that's why those who are hated are on the winning side. Jesus is turning the world around, and that's why he can talk like this. And I think the same goes for the woes. People who have made it, who think they have made it, by the world's eyes, they're going to be scandalized. Jesus is going to stick his finger in their side and he will needle them until they lash back at him and kill him. Jesus is going to goad them until they can't stand it anymore and then they will snuff him out just like they killed the prophets. And I think the same goes for this incredible love for enemies that Jesus preaches. How is that even possible? Well, it's possible for those people who have begun to suspect what Jesus is up to. Jesus is building up such an explosion of blessing and abundance and glory and riches and life and, and wholeness for those who get it, for those who follow him, 
that people are being allowed, even encouraged, to be very, very reckless with how they manage their lives. You don't need a big savings account because Jesus is going to give you the kingdom of heaven. You don't need a closet full of clothes because Jesus is going to give you the kingdom of heaven. It's yours. We, we don't need to always be angling this way and that, trying to make sure everybody likes us, to make sure everybody treats us just right, to make sure that nobody ever offends us. We can love our enemies, not, not because somehow that's calculated to make them our friends, not, not because, you know, it's some kind of reverse psychology, but simply because in the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is giving to us, there is so much favor that will be shown to us. There is so much blessing. There is so much honor that will be showered on us that we don't need to defend ourselves anymore. We can see the world like this. We can live with our enemies like this. We can give to those who beg because of what Jesus is doing to us and to our situation. Because power is coming out of Jesus. Because demons are fleeing when he comes into the room. Because people are being healed by the miraculous power of Jesus. Because poor people are being restored to health. Because Jesus has exploded onto the scene. All of this makes perfect sense. It's the natural way to live. Yes, but, but you might say, I'm still not sure I can live that way. Maybe, maybe I can catch a little glimpse of how someone like Jesus might say and do those things, but that just seems kind of impossible to me. I, I just don't see that happening in my circumstances anytime soon, you might be saying. Well, Let's go back to Connor McDavid. I think we become the people that Jesus is in the same way that Connor McDavid became a hockey player by practice. McDavid started when he was four years old, and then he practiced for years. He did drills and more drills. He did mental exercises and more mental exercises. He played games where he failed, where he succeeded. Then he went out and learned some more. He moved forward. He practiced. He drilled. He did more mental exercises. And then he played more games. I, I think that's kind of how we become like Jesus. You don't start off by being a hero. You start off by becoming a Christian. A little Christ, somebody who is intent on imitating Jesus. We begin by simply telling Jesus, yes, yes, I want to be your disciple. I believe in who you are. I see that I can't really live any other way. And the first thing that Jesus will do uh, when we say yes like that is he's going to forgive all the wrong that we have ever done. All that guilty baggage, he's going to throw that into the garbage so that you don't have to think about that anymore. And then he is going to fill you with his spirit, with his power. Nothing that Jesus teaches us here can be done without his spirit inside of us. And then he's going to give you some church community, some people around you to practice this stuff on. And then the practicing begins. Every day you will make dozens of choices. Most of them very small. And every time you make even a tiny choice in the direction of what Jesus teaches, you gain a little more skill. You gain a little more power, a little more capacity. You start with the small stuff. And every day you reach a little bit further. In the Christian tradition, there's all kinds of drills that we go through to teach us bit by bit to become the kind of person that Jesus calls us to be. One of them is attending weekly worship. That's one drill that you go through every week to teach you what it means to be like Jesus. Another one is taking the Lord's Supper regularly. That's another drill. Doing a regular Bible study with your fellow teammates. It's another drill. Maybe another drill is learning how to love your mom and dad. The people that you grew up with, your siblings. That's a, that's a small practice. That's a drill. Maybe you're going to need to forgive your boss one day who was not very respectful towards you. It's another drill. 
Maybe you're going to start giving some of your money to the poor. Set it up every week. That's a little drill. Maybe you're going to have to forgive some small things. You practice on that. And of course, none of this is just going through the motions. We can do this all thoughtfully, uh, relying on the Holy Spirit. And we do this always going back and seeing our faults, seeing our sins, which are many, asking for forgiveness and finding again this incredible forgiving love that Jesus pours out. That's a drill. And by all this practicing, we learn bit by bit to live this outrageous way that Jesus teaches us. This past week, I read the story of Gordon Wilson. Gordon Wilson was a Christian in Northern Ireland in 1987. And one day he was attending a peace ceremony, sort of a peace and reconciliation ceremony with his daughter, Marie, when a, ter a terrorist bomb exploded and killed his daughter, Marie, along with nine other people. Here's what Gordon Wilson told the media just a few hours after this horrific event. He said, I've lost my daughter and we shall miss her, but I bear no ill will. I bear no grudge. That will not bring her back. Don't ask me, please, for a purpose. I don't have an answer, but I know there has to be a plan. If I didn't think that, I would commit suicide. It's part of a greater plan, and we shall meet again. Now, when you listen to that, doesn't that almost sound impossible? How is that even real? How can somebody forgive like that so instinctively? Well, I don't know this, but my guess is that Gordon Wilson has been doing his drills. For many, many years, he's been practicing on all kinds of small little places where he has needed to forgive. Through the incredible work of the Spirit in his life over all those years of practicing and practicing and doing those drills, this, this posture, this attitude somehow became natural for him. It kind of became his second nature by the grace of Jesus working in his life. And then finally, when he got to that horrific moment, when the pain in his soul is so powerful that he doesn't even know how to think. This is what comes out naturally. And I would have to confess that that's a pretty daunting mountain for me to think about. I don't know that I could do that if that happened to me today. But I can practice. I can do a small drill to learn the first step of that, maybe even this afternoon. And you know, God will carry us. He will lead us as we walk up the path of this mountain. He will show us by the Holy Spirit what we can do to learn a little more each day. And God will forgive us as we fail, and he will teach us. It's his life that we are living. I'm sure you all echo me in saying thank you to Leighton, wherever he is this morning. Um, I invite you to stand as we close in response to what we've heard. Behind your regrets and mistakes, come 
Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24 say, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. <laughs> 